Hello. Uh, so I'm going to give you an example of a lecture. Uh, and uh, you won't see much on the screen. You're just going to see the, the professor on the screen. It's not a video, it's just audio. So you're going to see the picture of the professor. Sometimes they will show you a picture like the one that you can see on the PowerPoint right now, an ant and a spider, just to give you an idea uh, of what the lecture is about. But you, you, it's not going to be a video. It's just going to be audio. So you're, we're going to listen, and I will take notes. So then uh, you can see how it works. And again, uh, just to remind you, if there is a word that you don't understand very well, a technical word, and you don't know how to spell, just write as fast as you can. The questions are going to be multiple choice, so you can compare them uh, to your notes later on. So let's see how it works. Review. Listening section. Questions 5 to 10. Lecture. Listen to part of a lecture in a zoology class. As you know from the textbook, mimicry isn't limited to insects, but it's most common among them, and by mimicry I'm referring to the likeness between two insects that aren't closely related but look very much alike. The insects that engage in mimicry are usually very brightly colored. One of the insects, the one that's characterized by an unpleasant taste, a bad smell, a sting or bite, that insect's called the model. The mimic looks like the model, but doesn't share the characteristic that protects the model from predators. But of course, the predators associate the color pattern or some other trait with the unpleasant characteristic and leave both insects alone. Henry Bates was one of the first naturalists who noticed that some butterflies that closely resemble each other were actually unrelated. So mimicry, in which one species copies another, is called Batesian mimicry. I have some lab specimens of a few common mimics in the cases here in the front of the room, and I want you to have a chance to look at them before the end of the class. There's a day-flying moth with brown and white and yellow markings. And this moth's the model because it has a very unpleasant taste and tends to be avoided by moth eaters. But you'll notice that the swallowtail butterfly mounted beside it has very similar coloration. And actually, the swallowtail doesn't have the unpleasant taste at all. Another example is the monarch butterfly, which is probably more familiar to you since they pass through this area when they're migrating but you may not know that they have a very nasty taste because I seriously doubt that any of you have eaten one. But for the predators who do eat butterflies, this orange and black pattern on the monarchs, a warning signal not to sample it. So the viceroy butterfly here is a mimic. Same type of coloring, but no nasty taste. Nevertheless, the viceroy isn't bothered by predators either because it's mistaken for the monarch. So. How does a predator know that the day-flying moth and the monarch aren't good to eat? Well, a bird only has to eat one to start avoiding them all, models and mimics. A stinging bumblebee is another model insect. The sting's painful and occasionally even fatal for predators, so there are a large number of mimics. For example, there's a beetle that mimics bumblebees by beating its wings to make noise. And the astonishing thing is that it's able to do this at the same rate as the bumblebee, so exactly the same buzzing sounds created. I don't have a specimen of that beetle, but I do have a specimen of the hoverfly, which is a mimic of the honeybee. And it makes a similar buzzing sound, too. When you compare the bee with the fly, you'll notice that the honeybee has two sets of wings, and the hoverfly has only one set of wings. But as you can imagine, the noise and the more or less similar body and color will keep most predators from approaching closely enough to count the wings. Some insects without stingers have body parts that mimic the sharp stinger of wasps or bees. Although the hawk moth is harmless, it has a bundle of hairs that protrudes from the rear of its body. The actual purpose of these hairs is to spread scent, but to predators, the bundle mimics a stinger closely enough to keep them away, especially if the hawk moth is moving in a threatening way as if it were about to sting. There's a hawk moth here in the case, and to me at least, it doesn't look that much like the wasp mounted beside it. But remember, when you're looking at a specimen, it's stationary, and in nature, the movement's also part of the mimicry. Oh, here's a specimen of an ant, and this is interesting. 
Another naturalist, Fritz Müller, hypothesized that similarity among a large number of species could help protect all of them. Here's what he meant. After a few battles with a stinging or biting ant, especially when the entire colony comes to the aid of the ant being attacked, a predator will learn to avoid ants, even those that don't sting or bite, because they all look alike and the predator associates the bad experience with the group. And by extension, the predator will also avoid insects that mimic ants, like harmless beetles and spiders. Look at this. I have a drawing of a specimen of a stinging ant, beside a specimen of a brownish spider, and the front legs of the spider are mounted so they look more like antennae because that's just what the spider does to mimic an ant. That way it appears to have six legs like an ant instead of eight like a spider. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left and I want you to take this opportunity to look at the specimen cases here in the front of the room. I'll be available for questions if you have them. How about forming two lines on either side of the cases so more of you can see at the same time? Whew, okay, so as you can see, uh, it's a lot of information and you have to write very, very quickly and use a lot of symbols and abbreviations and, and uh, I'm glad the, the questions come right after because maybe in like 15 minutes I won't understand my notes anymore. Um, but as you can see, there are lots of symbols, uh, different, equal, a lot of arrows. Uh, instead of writing no, then I just write the word and I cross it out. Uh, sometimes I don't know the spelling of the word, but I just guess what it is because then in the question you may see something similar and you know what it is. Also, um, as you, you, you can notice that the, the teacher gives lots and lots of examples, so then probably you, you, you can guess that the questions will be uh, about the examples. Uh, and you are, we are going to see the questions in the next video, and uh, I will clean up the notes a little bit so we can understand it, them a little bit more, and then I'm going to use the clean notes to show you the questions and the answers for them. Okay, see you next time.